thank you for joining me, first of all. Um, I feel like I'm going to out you if I just tell people, like, you're one of the nicest guys in technology. Because, I don't know, we've been ca catching up at events and stuff now for I don't even know how many years. Like, certainly 20, maybe 17 or 18. When we started I'm talking about doing the podcast, I went back and did a little digging on, on your history. And so one of the first things that's super cool to me is how you had this uh, physics background. And I just finished um, Faye Faley's book, too. And then, of course, she was also um, into physics. Um, and, of course, you guys each kind of have your Stanford association, although she you know, did her PhD before going over there. But, um, I mean, t tell me a little bit about, like, the history here, the physics, the transition to technology. And, I mean, I think maybe you could contextualize for people who are curious because your breadth is astounding. When we met, you were doing, you know, networking. You obviously, that was your you know, PhD topic, you did big switch, all these other things, but now here you are like at the forefront, you know, staring at AI and you had a stint doing, you know, Ubico as well um, as a security person. So I don't know. Tell me a little bit about it. I, I clearly get distracted easily. I have a hard time uh, keeping a steady job, right? The, no, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the beauty about physics is it, uh, it helps you, you learn to think, right? You learn to solve fairly complex abstract problems. The downside of physics is there's not nearly enough jobs in physics as there's people studying physics. So most physicists, or at least half of them afterwards, do something uh, completely different. And you know, I think I was in that boat as well. Like, you know, figured out doing my, my undergrad that physics is, uh, is, is fun, computer science is more fun. I finished my physics degree just because Germany switching is, is incredibly hard, uh, you know, once, once you've started with a major. And then, you know, via robotics, uh, meandered into, uh, into computer science, uh, did, did my PhD at Stanford. And, um, you know, when I, when I started Sephora, I initially wanted to do robotics, but that was not a particularly interesting time in robotics, right? There was not much, not that much happening. It picked up, you know, maybe five, six, seven years later. Um, but at that time, you know, was, um, the progress was slow and uh, wireless networking just came out. So I started getting into networking. That was super exciting. Um, yeah, then I spent some time in security, spent some time in systems uh, and infrastructure. I think I'm still an infrastructure guy by heart. But, uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, on in terms of innovation and investments, obviously the most interesting thing is, is artificial intelligence. That's the the mega cycle that has just started, uh, you know, and uh, it's uh, it's it's super fascinating. I know. I feel like I'm holding back to even like jump in on the AI questions. Like uh, I want to bury the lead and tease everyone because I I just totally want to talk about it just so much. But I've, I had to hold back just a little bit <laughs> to ask something uh, just to have a little variety um, because yeah, AI is, AI is always on my mind. Um, let me ask you a question, though, because I got curious about the networking side of things. Like, do you think it was like your physics background and your, you know, being an infrastructure person, like you kind of took a different branch of SDN when you started Big Switch because you guys were, you were focused on building, I think, on top of a you know, white box hardware platform, not just pure SDN, not just the S in SDN, right? As opposed to other startups, um, maybe with other PhD candidates who had Nick McCowan as sort of advisor who... <laughs> Um, did, went the other route. I'm just kind of curious, though. Like, do you feel like that affinity with hardware is one one of those things that led to that? I don't think so. I mean, the the reason we actually we started out doing both software and white box switches, and and essentially what happened is that it became clear, you know, once uh, an server was acquired by VMware, that there was really no good path to do a pure software, um, software defined networking company. Right? And we figured out doing both is very hard. Right, doing both hardware and software. Um, uh, and doing only software is hard just because it's getting absorbed essentially into the infrastructure layer. Right? Uh, VMware is building it into their, uh, in, into their software ecosystem to vSphere. And uh, you know, on the, the, the open source side, there's an opportunity, but OpenStack you know, wasn't, wasn't getting that much traction. Kubernetes wasn't there yet. So it wasn't quite clear how you would insert in, in that space. Right? And doing overlays in the cloud Still a bit early, and um, you know, it's also was clear would bump into the cloud players. So at that point, you know, it was it was more out of necessity that we said, you know, if we, if we want to do this, we probably have to do this with physical hardware because that, that's physical hardware for for classic data centers, which back then was a much larger market than it is today, right? That, that was still a an area where you had a number of incumbents like the Cisco's and Junipers, and uh, not quite yet, or maybe just Arista had started, uh, you know, and, and at that time. But where, where there was still a lot more open space for, for innovation. Yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of interesting, too, because I feel like some of the hardware that you see inside of computers just come, like, ridiculously far. Like, I look at the Connect X5 and Connect X6, and they're just so powerful. I mean, to say nothing of, like, 
the networking hardware they're putting into the uh, what are they like GH, you know, the Grace Hopper cards. Um, I saw that one guy from uh, NVIDIA, uh, Jeff, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, actually, who works on NVIDIA's hardware stack, just talking about their 400 gigs of networking and how it's aligned with the memory bandwidth on the card and stuff. It's kind of incredible, which is interesting. And maybe this is a good segue. I mean, the first time I started talking to people about, you know, doing like heavy ML, you know, GPU workloads, it was actually genomic stuff, right? And that was a faction and we were doing this multi-cloud supercomputer and it was great. We built what I think, you know, by my measurements at the time, would have been about the 50th fastest supercomputer just out of spot instances in Northern Virginia, right across all three clouds at once. And at the time, you know, DGX was kind of the king of the hill, but I didn't see tons of people who needed more GPUs than that. But to me, it feels like now there's this sort of upward pressure. And so you see this thing happening on the networking cards because there's this desire for even more throughput than you can reasonably build with some kind of like interconnected hardware backplane. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that, because I know you're thinking a ton about this. Yeah, I mean, um, look, I, I think one of the, the core insights from, from AI of, uh, of, of, of last decades is the bitter lesson, right? That building larger systems that can deploy more compute and, and, and are based on more data typically gives you a superior outcome. And, and that often is more important than fine tuning your algorithms really, or, or is more important, at least, than sort of a structural understanding of the problem, trying to project human knowledge into, into the system. And so we're trying to build models larger and larger, right? At this point, actually, we're flattening off a little bit because we're getting data limited. But for a while, right, people were trying to build larger and larger models. And, uh, you know, a, a single uh, a GPU only has so much memory, uh, you know, that, uh, that you can, can squeeze on it. And if you want to go beyond that, you need to... Um, essentially split it across multiple of these cards and up to eight you can do it on one system right? but then you run out of uh, a bandwidth on the system and at that point you need to uh, you know rely on a network bandwidth to to uh, run this across a, a larger number of nodes and the you know the, this is both for for training but but also for inference today uh, uh, used a fair amount uh, it's mostly for training but a little bit for inference too and the, the reason is simply that um you know, the, the, uh, the current GPU design, you very quickly, quickly run to memory bandwidth limitations, right? I just can't, my, my model is so big, it doesn't fit into the, um, the video RAM of my GPU. So I need to swap it in and out, right? If I do this, I'm getting basically limited by, um, by the memory or, you know, even if it fits into the, the GPU memory, I still have the issue of swapping it in and out there, my, my actual cores. And uh, I can, to some degree, alleviate that by, by taking the model, splitting into many slices, right? And, and and each slice only has a minimal amount of swapping, but now I increase the amount of data that needs to be sent between the slices, right? And that's how we get these very high bandwidth um, demand for for trading and, and large model inference. Yeah. But, yeah. Is there something systemic um, in the nature of, like, designing the cards, or do you think those memory bandwidth limitations, right, where you've got, you know, processors that could do more if they could get more memory is just a sort of side effect of, like, I like to point out to people that 2023 is going to be the first year when NVIDIA's data center business exceeded their gaming revenue. When people, you know, it's like commented one of your LinkedIn threads Easily, once, right, yeah. we owe the AI revolution to gamers. It's like, do, do you think that this is something that just kind of gets solved, you know, generationally as as they shift more towards like, and not just necessarily NVIDIA, right? But people shift more towards like AI focused design. I mean, I don't think it's a solvable problem per se. I mean, fundamentally, the issue here is we want to uh, we want to run compute on very large amounts of data, right? And we're going to run into some level of restrictions, uh, you know, where we can store and, and transfer that data. We're trying different approaches to to solve this, right? And the I mean, I mean, I think as long as um, as long as we can't build systems where our largest models simply fit into, you know, the, the, the core processing unit itself, if you can do that, right, then the problem will be solved, right? We don't need to do this, this send the data anymore. But as long as that's not the case, I think we will need, we, you know, we will distribute it and we'll need more and more. We want to have as much bandwidth as possible between, between these. Okay. Um, so something I wonder about too, and I mean, I, 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 I follow a bunch of like, daily paper things and i feel like um as much as i spend tons of time like working with and tinkering with and thinking about like what can be done with llms i feel like you cover that right when you're talking about this stuff but you also spend a bunch of time covering you know the stable diffusions the videos and and image generation do you think i'm curious what your take is on 
where the sort of, I want to say marketable value, right? Because I think there's going to be tons of advancements on both and it's like breathtaking the pace of change. But when I look at just what the paper's saying literally in the past like three or four days, completely blowing my mind, like these automatic constructions of 3D scenes, you know, this like transparent one picture face mapping that's like, or picture, you know, object mapping that's like competitive with control net. It blows my mind. Like, um, do you, do you think there's like a huge commercial uptick like right around the bend for that? Because it feels like the state of the state has moved so fast there that there's just so much that could be done with it. I mean, it's predicting the future in this environment at the moment is incredibly hard, right? The innovation is, is, is moving very, very quickly. You know, it's sometimes a lot of the usefulness of these these new technologies depends on how reliable they are. And, you know, in the early stages, you have no idea of the... The lack of reliability is just because it's so new or because it's an inherent limitation in, in the models that you have, right? So it's I, we, we look at these things and, you know, we, we don't trust our intuition. I think the best thing is to usually to go to people who are actually using it and ask them, is this ready for, uh, what are you using this for? And they're saying like, yeah, you know, this kind of solves this problem over here and that's why I'm using it. And it's just a very standard use case. Like, okay, this is across the mainstream, right? If it's more on demos, right, then it's still so early a stage. I mean, there are a couple of areas, I think, where we're clearly seeing models generating value, right? I mean, you know, coding assistance, for example, is a pretty consistent feedback we're seeing that, you know, makes a developer more productive, right? How much? Depends on the use case, but, you know, I'm I'm hearing, I think, numbers around 30% or so, if I have to pick a, a median. Um, you know, and that's uh, that's a big step forward, right? I mean, if I can take a, a person that, that costs me $100,000 or $200,000 a year, and I can make them 30% more uh, productive with something that costs me, you know, a couple of $10 a, a, a month uh, maximum, right? That's super, super, super attractive, right? Um, we're seeing other areas, like, for example, LLMs are to answer support questions, right? Give them, give a knowledge base, use RAG, and, you know, then then answer uh, questions from users. Works really well. Users are happier. Escalations are down, right? So that, that also seems to be sort of a, a standard use case. There aren't that many of those, right? There's probably a half a dozen or so where we're really seeing so if a cookie cutter user pattern emerge, um, you know, for images, for example, I've talked to um, like uh, marketing agencies basically have essentially a virtual photo studio, right? So if uh, Mark Wallace wants to do his um, world tour as a DJ, they would take a couple of uh, pictures and then uh, train a model on that. And, you know, now I can say I want I, I want a photo in uh, in front of the London skyline. And, uh, you know, and it can even control a much more fine grain that I basically rig, a, a, you know, a person in something like Blender, right? Extract pose information and then can basically position, you know, the, the uh, um, uh, you know, Matt Wallace in a very, very peculiar way in front of the New York, uh, in front of the London skyline. So I can basically really have all the artistic control that a photographer would have at a tiny fraction of the cost, right? I don't need to, to hire a photo crew for this i'm gonna need to have the music gen stuff before i have the dj career too right so i'll have to have the music and then i can do my photo shoot because my agent or in music is great i guess the developer thing hits close to home and i feel like personally the productivity change for me is a lot higher but it's probably because i i didn't spend that much time in my career writing code like plenty like hundreds of thousands of lines but nothing like you know what maybe avowed non-stop you know software engineers did when they're been around as long as i have and, and it, so i think I benefit from having like more breadth than, and not enough depth. And actually the AI helps me more, you know, kind of get fine tuned on things. But it makes me wonder too, like, you know, like many people. That's typical, by the way. It helps most for code, which has been written many times before, right? Which is fairly cookie cutter and where you understand the least. That makes sense. Yeah. And so it, it which, which has a nice side benefit, which is, it disproportionately helps with boring menial work. So it actually no, it typically also uh, increases uh, developer uh, happiness. Yeah. I've thought a lot about that too. And it's kind of funny how you, you stumble across things that people don't ask. Like at one point I was dealing with, um, you know, writing code around a, a to um, an embedding generator, right? That would use the tokenizer to figure out how many tokens it was to split on, you know, the kind of boundary of the the size of the embeddings that an embedding model could take, right? So you didn't feed it too many tokens, but you didn't waste tokens, right? Because it'd be inefficient to split text. But as much as I had asked a bunch of questions of like chat GPT or something at the time, right? And, and as much as it was helping along, it never volunteered something that's very important, which is, by the way, when you encode something and decode something, you're not necessarily getting the same text back, right? So it was my relief that when you encode and decode and then re-encode, at least in my use case, 
it was at least the same encoding as the first time, which was good enough for me. But it's like a lot of interesting caveats. I'm sure this is why people are saying like you end up with a lot of bugs because, you know, those little things that you zoom past as you're going really fast can come back and bite you. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the... The, I think AI today is a little bit like your intern or somebody like that. They can they're good they're good in, in doing stuff, right? But uh, it's not something with necessarily perfect quality. You have to to double check the work. No, yeah, this seems reasonable. So I mean, like anybody, I I spend a little bit of time like you know scrolling notifications from blind, and I do feel like there's this. I mean, there's a clear thing going on in tech. I would see even the jobs report that came out the other day, like payrolls in every industry, ADP reported were up, except information, which was down um, a little bit. You know, what's your, when you think about the future, I know I'm like asking, and I, I would never hold you to this, like your gut feel, I feel like this is one of those things where it's it's subject to like Jevon's paradox here and like as software engineering gets, you know, more efficient and therefore less expensive for the value produced, people want still more and more of it? Or is AI so strong and so good that there's like actually some aggregate reduction in demand? That's a very good question. I mean, I'm not sure I, I, I can support, strongly support either answer here, but, but my, my current guess is there is, there's so many things which I would like to do with a dedicated software process where I don't have it right now. And there's so much really, really crappy software out there. I think there's still a lot of value to be generated. So my, my guess is, you know, the, the lower cost will increase the marginal demand sufficiently that overall we'll see more people in software. Right? There's a second thing, which is, I mean, these these super cycles take time, right? And they, uh, we're, we're still, uh, you know, the, there's the whole IT and internet revolution isn't done yet, right? So I think we're still sort of seeing a shift from, from uh, uh, you know, like the, the, the post-industrial uh, jobs to, uh, you know, towards information processing jobs in, uh, at the macro level. So between those two, my guess is we'll, we'll probably see an expansion. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I tend to feel like that's at least, you know, true in the short term, you know, taking out any sort of theory around, like, what happens if AI is self-improving? Like, you see the people talking about Altman doing, you know, YC kickoffs where they're, you know, going, plan for a world where AGI exists. I'm like, what does that even mean? Because that's a pretty huge, like, statement, right? I have no idea. I know. It's <laughs> completely, you're just, compl it's completely up a chart. Meanwhile, you're kind of thinking, like, hey, maybe you should stop Mitchell from overtaking you, but that's neither here nor there. So, you know, something I love to ask people, though, too, and it kind of dovetails off of that, like, what, what happens with growth in software engineering? I mean, if you were talking to somebody who was, say, heading into college now picking a major like where do you think you know and maybe they had interests like across like you know science scientific disciplines right so maybe they're interested in physics maybe they're interested in biology so many of the people i talk to actually come from those you know other hard sciences and a computer science i'm sure some of that was just the sort of like growth and commercial differential right um what do you think aside from you know what do you think part of technology looks really bright over the next call it you know 10 to 30 years maybe um Boy, hard to predict. Uh, look, AI is probably not a bad area to go into right now. Just, you know, super cycles usually have some legs and, you know, this one won't be over quickly. And, you know, how, how deep you go, if you go more for the application layer or really go on to the model layer, it's a good question. But I think, you know, taking some of that makes sense. I mean, the other thing is, look, I, I think if, if I was starting college today, I would certainly start with computer science and not necessarily because I want to be a computer scientist per se. But I think basically because I think there's lots of other areas where computer science has become an incredibly important tool to do anything in that area, but the the, the majors have not caught up to that fact yet. And so, you know, to, to learn enough computer science to be successful in that area, you probably want to have a, a solid computer science education, if that makes sense, right? I mean, like if it's... Imagine we lived in a world where I could study reading and writing or a specialty subject. Well, you know, first thing I would do is study reading and writing because I need this anywhere, right? And, and if I don't know reading and writing, I'm probably not efficient in business or, or medicine, right? I think we're a little bit in a, in a similar thing where, you know, in, in many areas, I mean, if I just want to be a doctor, okay, I, I go for medicine. But if I want to be a researcher in medicine, right, probably I'm going to look at automated experiments. I want to look at, you know, fairly sophisticated tools for analyzing them. And it's not clear to me that necessarily the curriculums of all the universities, you know, those specialty areas have fully caught up yet with the, with the, you know, giving you the foundations that you need. So, so I would probably start with computer science and then, you know, figure out how to specialize um, after that.
Yeah, I mean, this actually reminds me of all the, like, really interesting work that's been done outside of pure computer science. It's nothing to do with LLMs, but still uses, you know, ML, still uses deep learning. You think about things like, um, you know, the fine-tuning of the magnetic field on the torque reactors or people building the um, fast pétés, like, you know, plastic breakdown enzyme, those kind of things. It's like, do you think for, for use cases like that, I'm not close to be doing that kind of work. I've talked to tons of people doing work in LLMs and, and kind of business applications around that nowadays, but not really that side. Are you better off being, you know, a, a material scientist, a physicist, a biologist that picks up computer science, or are you better off being like a hardcore, you know, ML, I study neural networks, I understand how this, you know, how to build one and train it, and then I'm going to pick up the physics and biology for that use case? Or, or is it you, do you have to have both? I mean, you just partner up inside of some org. I think you need both. I, I think you need both. I just, look, to, to some degree, I, you, you learn reading and writing before you learn your specialty subject, right? If the, you learn that elementary school. <laughs> then the specialty subjects you learn maybe in middle or high school. And, and so the, I think the computer science is more, now, more a foundation, right? It's something that allows us to automate our thinking. And, and so... I think it's more of a horizontal discipline where I would start with that and then learn the specialty on top. Yeah. I mean, it's that whole automating think, thinking thing is much more true right nowadays. I mean, I think this is the the horsepower of all of this, like neural, neural networks is being able to like almost start with a theory and find some data and then start, you know, training models that kind of ex explore or extrapolate things that you, you just couldn't do empirically. Because I mean, m much like the whole, you know, um, you know, sequencing the, uh, I want to say the proteome, right? Like going out there and, and doing this uh, deep fold type predictions around um, amino acids folding into proteins, like just mountains and mountains of manual labor. And obviously people saw value in it. I mean, how long was folding at home started? Like 20 years ago? A really long time. I remember like installing it on Linux boxes in times of yore to do torture tests. And, and obviously there was value then, but now obviously the technology, both hardware and the software, you know, and the neural networks have come so far. It feels like, uh, it does feel like a new frontier, like in all of those sciences is what, just how I'm looking at it. It's kind of as a layman, but I feel like you're probably closer to it than I am. Yeah, I think it's true. I mean, it's, I think computer science probably needs to be taught a lot more like computer literacy, right? That basically prepares people for using you know, the basic tools, basic scripting, basic programming languages um, for the particular specialty discipline. At, at the moment, I think what's happening is that a lot of that is just getting so absorbed by computer science, right? Sh should uh, large language models really be in linguistics or not? Well, we, we <laughs> in theory, probably, right? In practice, if you look at what those departments are doing, you know, it, it wouldn't quite work. So, so at the moment, it's just, I think, a lot that's, that's shifting over into, into computer science. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, that's to me, this is like now we're going in really esoteric territory, right? It feels like a la language is an interface for thought. I and mean, that's a really weird, abstract way to put it, right? But it's like, I've had a lot of conversations, obviously, because there's this whole stochastic parrot wing of technologists who are like, it doesn't think, it doesn't do anything, right? And it's, it's a pretty extreme put down on what LLMs can really do, you know, especially when the circumstances and the sort of operator, I think, is doing the right thing. But it also makes me wonder... Um, will we see, I notice like people like Alan LeCun, right, talking about the huge bandwidth that goes into a toddler, right? And what they see every single day of their lives, what the throughput of all that is. I, I think, obviously, distilled language where people are talking about their thought process or talking about functions, things of that nature, like when they're describing science, things can be much more high bandwidth, even than the visuals. But what do you think about, do you, how long, let me ask it this way. Let me go way out there. How long do you think it'll be before somebody tries to start training, and I don't want to say LLM, really training a model where it's sort of like continuous training and they're trying to put as many parameters in as they can and they're feeding it, it they're giving it you know, some embodiment, some video, some audio, some ability to interact. And, and really they try to like emulate the experience of learning as you live um, really in, in a you know hardware plus software kind of package. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, first of all, your analysis is completely right, that basically language is a way for us to store long-term abstract knowledge, right? And, and that was relatively easy to take. All of mankind's knowledge, squeeze that through an LLM, squeeze that through a model, right? And that's what gets us LLMs, which have these amazing capabilities. And so if it helps for the more complex reasoning tasks, right? It doesn't help you at all to run through a forest, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? Avoiding trees or 
uh, you know, figuring out how to, how to use your limbs, right? Uh, you don't learn that from books. You learn that by running through a forest and maybe hitting trees as a toddler, right? And, and then uh, and then you get really, really good at that, right? And, and uh, I think the other the other interesting thing is that like the the language understanding is a relatively new function for humans. Right? I mean, humans have had language. For hundred thousand years, uh, you know, but not not uh, not millions of years, probably, right? Uh, like high, high abstraction languages. Um, you know, how long have our ancestors been running successfully through a forest? <laughs> right? Well, it's uh, can add many zeros, right? It's uh, I don't know three or four. I don't even know, but but uh, maybe not four, but but you know, it's it's no maybe four. It's many many zeros. Um, you know the the um. So it's I think to some degree. Building a system that's on par with a human about these language reasoning things might be easier than building something that's good in running through a forest just because evolution had so much more time to, to optimize that. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It seems like people are doing a pretty good job of, of getting you know, a variety of things like you know, reinforcement learning and, and so on applied to things like robotic motion, sometimes with obviously help from LLMs, which <laughs> seem to be really good at like instructing a robot how to practice moving or things of that nature, right? There's really cool stuff going on there. But I, I also think a really interesting thing that seems like it permeates our worldview and it's it's really not that present in language is that we understand like our place moving through time and I don't want to have like a, you know, t time place moving through time and I don't want to have like a general relativity conversation about it, but we perceive, you know, the flow of time and seems like LMs in a certain sense are like stuck in the moment. Like they, they have an ability to plan, like they understand to some extent, and I'm using the word understand obviously really use, loosely, but they know that there is a past and a future. And if you say in order to do something, you know, what would I do? Give it to me step by step. They can come up with a plan knowing that one thing follows the other follows the other. But I think that there's something fundamental to the human experience about cause and effect. And I think truly that, that there's this idea of you understand your entire life and it's reinforced in everything you do that an action has a reaction, right? And a cause has an effect. And I think that, that the depth of that particular thing, the temporal nature of the progress and action and reaction is something that really is missing from LLMs because it's like it, they know about it, but it's like scratched on the surface deep of something that's like so thick, you know? And I think maybe that's where I think that kind of idea of training something over time, um, especially if you try to structure it, you know, so that it like, treated the kind of progress of things as a first class citizen. I don't even know how you'd structure a network like that, but kind of where I was thinking maybe it would make a big difference. I think it's why the LLMs are not aware of, of time and space, right? <laughs> which, which is very fundamental to how humans perceive everything. Um, they are only at a high level of abstraction. There are some folks that are trying to build world models, right? Where they, where you really look at your surrounding, at least try to create a three D model. Maybe not temporal yet, but in some ways it's temporal as well, right? Where you're really trying to understand what's happening then. Where you're trying to learn from, where a robot is trying to learn from its own actions and doing sort of a two two stage thing, right? The high level question of, I don't know, you know, like there's a fire. What could I use to to uh, put out the fire? That has to come from the LLM, right? That's knowledge, right? And then the, uh, you know, grab the water bucket kind of thing that comes from the lower level. Uh, you know, actuation and, and sort of more reflexively learned thing. It's a super interesting area. I mean, I think one thing we've learned is anything in the physical world is much harder than than it is in, in LMs, right? Because, you know, suddenly you're dependent on the physical hardware that you're using. You're dependent on, you know, the environment. You're, you know, like a, a wheeled robot is different from a robot with legs and so on, right? So that we haven't found general representations yet, or at least they're not widely, you know, they're not widely used yet that we could uh, that we could build these things on. I think the other big challenge for anything in the physical world is there's no value chain yet that has come together to actually make this happen. Right? Let's assume I had a great robotics model, for example. Right? I still need to need to buy the robot somewhere in order to to make this useful. Right? Now, LM is useful by itself because it just takes takes data as input and and or text as input and and spits out text. But for 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 anything in the real world, it's much much harder. Yeah. You, um, I don't know if you follow what he says or if you've met him and chatted with him too, but I, I find it really interesting to listen to what Fred Adcock is saying, right? He's the figure guy that was also behind Archer. And, you know, there was a tweet he had maybe four or six weeks ago, and he was talking about how the, the massive progress with LLMs and kind of the, the them as sort of, 
I don't want to say necessarily embodying a brain, but like being able to drive like robot thinking so that it could actually plan and execute actions in a much more sophisticated way. I think he said something, he thought it would be like seven more years or something, and now he thought it was going to be 12 months or less, right? To kind of have the thinking behind what they would need to drive that robot to do things they want, which makes tons of sense, right? Because, you know, guys like Jim Fan, for example, who are always talking about, uh, you know, the NVIDIA, I want to say they call it Dojo Jim or something, but, you know, and behind like the Voyager project and things like that. Super fascinating stuff. And I, I kind of wonder if, like, I think people, basically human beings, that we don't maybe don't give ourselves enough credit, right, in the sense that every time we're doing something, we're like essentially continuously training. Like, even if we're watching a movie, you're talking about the fire, right? It's like, we actually are making a prediction. Like, what's this person going to do with the, you know, the, their, their room is on fire? You know, it's funny. Can you, can you imagine? <laughs> I guess we're doing this, right, because we're going to train the next generation of LLMs on YouTube videos, too, probably. But it's like, you know, you have this thought of, what would I do if a house is on fire? And I, my house has never been on fire. But if it caught fire, I'm pretty sure that I would want to, you know, put out the fire if it was safe to do so. I'd want to have a fire extinguisher. I know where one is. And if I couldn't do that, I'd want to get everybody out of the house and stay safe, right? I don't have to have experienced it before. And it feels almost, almost real because I've seen so many portrayals. And I think... Uh, but it's not just about seeing it and having those training data. There's almost, I think, like a we are in our brains making a prediction about how we behave or how we expect the person in that scenario to behave. And then we're evaluating almost like a loss function for what did they do? And maybe how did it work out even, you know? This is pretty, pretty yeah, I think so. I mean, no, this is This is how humans, this is what sets humans apart and how, how we, you know, that we can pass on knowledge effectively to other humans and so learn as a, as a group, right? And I think the, a movie, in a sense, is similar to the, you know, uh, the initial st telling stories around the fire or something like that. You know, which probably was one of the first, uh, uh, you know, learning, uh, you know, knowledge transmission mechanisms, uh, you know, that mankind had. I think it's, I think you're exactly right, right? Just, we're seeing situations and we're seeing behavior in the situations and we're drawing lessons from that, right? Good or bad. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's a great point, actually, too. Just obviously, you know, the movie is just the latest, like, high-tech version of, you know, all, all sorts of traditions for passing down knowledge, right? Sitting around the campfire or whatever. Kind of fun to think about, actually. Have you read um, Hawkins' Thousand Brains? I have not, I mean, it's no. a pretty good read, but I've been thinking a lot lately because he has this model that, that we actually, the human brain has like many versions of a concept. Like if you pull your coffee cup out of the cabinet, there's a version of your brain, like some cluster of neurons in your neocortex that recognize how it feels like when you hold the handle. But there's other things that have a, a concept of its weight and like how it should feel in your fingertips. So, you, you know, it's not the same part of your brain, basically it's holding it on the handle that's catching it if it slips and it's going to fall, right? It's like different models. And I also kind of realized too that there's these amazing parallels even between like how law, I mean, obviously LMs are hugely lossy, right? Because you've got this network, it's this incredible amount of compression and you, get, you do get incredible results, but it's ultimately, it can be very, very lossy at times. And and so are we, right? You, you realize then when you start studying like, Things like uh, eyewitness veracity, you know, in, in testimony, people forget and misremember and imagine false memories like really easily. Your brains are just not. We hallucinate reliable. too. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, people are like, oh, LMs hallucinate. Like, so do people. We're really good at it, in fact. Like, it's proven. And so it makes me wonder. Obviously, having just listened to Fei Fei's book too, I'm also thinking about all the people that have put this effort into constructing machines that act a lot like brain. And then, of course, we, we get these incredible results from better data sets and it, it does start making me wonder you have to think at some point like how close are we um you know to, to what human cognition is like like if we could tomorrow construct a hundred trillion parameter model I, I wouldn't call it an llm anymore right but a multimodal model that was connected to input and output in the world and just shoved it out in the world that's a lot of neurons would it be able to you know, pick things up in a way that a human does, like, you know, from first principles and interaction with the world, even if it was just an eyeball and the world's simplest little, you know, hand claw or something. I think we have no idea. I mean, at least I don't have any idea. Uh, it's the, I think people underestimated, or at least I underestimated, you know, how scale of LLMs can drive their, their capabilities, right? And, um, you know, I, I think we don't fully understand the relationship there yet, right? I think we're starting to more and more believe that it probably has more to do with data than with the scale of LN itself, right? Or this is the combination of the two. But but it's clear that if we if something has more data to learn from and is a larger model directionally that gives you better capabilities. More data better, better data better, more parameters better. And it's like those are dials and 
Uh, but we haven't even really seen something. It's interesting how we got GPT-4. It's been 10 months now, and it was, like, jaw-droppingly good. And then we've seen all these other models, right? You know, the PHIs of the world and, um, you know, the, some of the Mistral and Mixtral releases and so on do so well with so many fewer parameters. It's like I am just, I'm holding with, I'm literally waiting with bated breath, you know, for something that comes out that's got a trillion, a couple trillion parameters across a bunch of experts that like has applied everything that's been learned so far. And it, it's going to be, I mean, it's kind of exciting, right? <laughs> Who knows what's next? The interesting question is, do we, like the quality of the model, I think today mostly depends on the data I was trained on. Right? The reason why these small models do so well is because we figured out by overtraining them, right? you know, better than chinchilla optimal, we can actually build a small model of a very high quality. I think conversely, What's well, holding us back for the top uh, highest end models is that we don't have enough new data, right? I mean, the you know you train on the internet, and there frankly isn't that much more out there. It's like, and you know, if you get exclusive access to Reddit, yeah, that helps a little bit, but you know, like there's only so many incremental steps you can take there. So, I, my current feeling is, I'm not sure we'll see see a huge breakthrough, a huge step up, unless we figure out a way how models can can get more data, the synthetic data, or they learn from the world, you know, in a in a so more autonomously driven way or, or some, some other thing. But it seems like my gut feeling is that that's what's, what's limiting the growth at the moment. Well, here's an interesting thought. And I mean, I've, I've heard this is not my idea, right? I mean, I've seen a lot of people kind of imply this sideways and I don't know if the technology supports this as like a, as a viewpoint, right? So may I ask you, and maybe you don't know either. It seems like it's really esoteric. But as somebody pointed out, there's like hundreds of thousands or millions of hours of video that go onto YouTube every single day. And it's more data than has ever been digested. Like it's more data in one day maybe than all the text on the internet or something along those lines. It's astronomical. Now, this is kind of why I said earlier, I felt like language was like higher density, right? Because you can watch a 40 minute YouTube video where somebody tells you something and if they're sitting in front of a screen and just talking to you, at the end of the day, do you get much of your language model? You don't get much more out of that than what you get from the transcript, right? Um, yeah. But now I think, too, there's also like things like if you were to have, if a model could understand the world, right, and if it had enough visual acuity to like understand what all the things were and what they were doing in a series of frames, then watching a movie might actually teach them something, right, about cause and effect and stuff. Again, I feel like it's lossy compared no version, to the yeah. massive amount of bandwidth. And it would, you'd probably have to do a lot more work to turn that into like useful updates. I mean, it actually seems really challenging, too. Maybe this is where MOE helps. Because how do you update a set of neurons that have a loss function based on text prediction and then also somehow update them with video prediction? Like, it almost seems like this is where you need the model of the world to kind of normalize between those two because they're not remotely the same in terms of the information density or quality or directionality. I, anyways, I don't know. It's super fascinating to me to think about. I just feel like people are really thinking about this stuff at a whole... I mean, I think here's something we could agree on. Whatever was going on five years ago, there are like multiple orders of magnitude more people thinking about this with eyes on it. And that usually translates to progress at some point. I think it's true. Honestly, I'm not sure if the, like for, for multimodal models that take image and text input, right? We pretty, we figured out how to do that. We figured out how to train them, right? It's relatively straightforward. And surprisingly, the amount of, just you know, if you if you look at the the amount of bits that go into the actual model, right? You know, once it's expanded from text to to um, uh, you know tokens, the text is actually far more data intensive than the images. Interestingly enough. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, great. You, thank you for saying which, you that. Know, you, it, which I think is that exactly proves but the it, point. Yes, you're right because the features that come up through image recognition are relatively small. So I, I haven't seen a, a, a well, I haven't. I'm, they used a multimodal model yet that works with video, but you know. So I think there's hope there that, that it's not clear how much if this would actually be more than the text or less than the text. But uh, it's really just a question of can we find lots of high quality video data with good textual descriptions of what happens, or you know where where we can, which we can you know, which maybe you need one model to look at them and understand them and annotate them, then the second one can learn based on them. But uh, you know, we, we, um, I think it's certainly all all uh, doable. What what's not clear to me is 
how much did it actually expand, how, how much new data or new knowledge this is, right? I mean, look, the, the way how we get to, uh, how you get to a textbook is that humans process a lot of video and distill it down to the key, key points and key facts, right? And, and reflect back on it. And, uh, you know, if you then add the video back in, would that really add that much? Not entirely sure, right? I mean, maybe it'll flesh all the details, but it, it may actually not be such a, uh, such a huge step forward at the end of the day. I think the thing that I'm thinking about is not that it's necessarily that it increases your knowledge to you. Like, it doesn't make you better at understanding like how to solve an equation or write a program. And, and like watching, you know, it, watching Andrew Ng teach you an ML course, like if you're an LLM, is not going to teach you anything you didn't get from all the great tech book, tech textbooks, right? On the other hand, like there's that funny dichotomy where people love to point out how like language models sometimes make really silly mistakes, right? That's the kind of thing where I think maybe it, to me, the video is really about the temporality. It's about the flow of time, and it's about some kind of method to to basically think, like have a, a billions of more opportunities to think through cause and effect and things like that. I, it's because I don't know where humans pick this up from, right? I do know that that there, you obviously can pose a huge variety of incredibly simple questions to LLMs that they fall flat on, right? Because they're out of distribution in a certain sense. I do feel like we get into things as humans where our sort of distribution is much broader because we're constantly validating assumptions. I mean, it's weird too, because I also feel like there's motivations we have as people to like observe things like if cause and effect, because we're constantly risk assessing things and a model doesn't care, right? It doesn't have a self-preservation instinct. So it's like, it doesn't have That's the right. same motivation. So I don't know. Well, let me ask a weird question then. Let's say, what do you, what's your, what's your hope for maybe five or 10 years from now? Like when you think, when you're thinking big and kind of putting your imagination hat on, right? Like if you steer towards the optimist side, like where, where do you think we could be? Like what's the, what does the scope of possibility look like? That's impossible to predict. I mean, look, um, <laughs> imagine this was, imagine, you know, we were sitting here and we just uh, played around with the first web browser ever. Fine. And then you are sort of, you know, try predicting DoorDash. <laughs> it's, it's like, that's, uh. It's incredibly hard, right? I mean, you can sort of see the, the first order effects, but the second order effects are, are incredibly hard to predict. They're incredibly hard first to you, First, you make the first web browser, and the next thing you know, you're like one of the world's most famous venture capitalists, right? There we go. <laughs> Can't predict I mean, that. The, 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 thing, the thing is, we've built the base models, that, which are like components, right? It's the same way like we, like we invented a database, right? A database allows us to take data storage and retrieval and encapsulate it in a system where I don't need to understand the system anymore, right? Uh, I've no idea. Well, most people have no idea how a database works internally, right? How, what is a B star tree? Yeah, I did that once as an undergrad, right? But, but it's, you probably don't need this uh, if you would just write SQL queries, right, to understand how the indexing underneath works. Um, and best of luck, right? Because there's, there's 15 different things now because you've got, you know, relational, NoSQL, time series, and, and everything is under the hood is different. So even if you learn one, you know how the pick, other 14 work. <laughs> even if you just pick like, like lowly SQL databases, simple SQL databases, right, from, from the early days, right? The, the, the big breakthrough was you could use them without understanding how they work, yeah. right? The, so the complexity was encapsulated. Here's your a, a SQL interface. Know that no structured query language, you're good, right? How indices are, are, are maintained, not your problem anymore. You have an abstraction on top, right? And it's like same with, or take networking, right? Here's a socket, right? Data to the socket or read data from the socket, right? How exactly does BGP work? It's like, that's not your problem anymore, right? That's now taken care of, right? Here's a very simple abstraction. takes all the complexity of the backend, right? And, and encapsulates it. I think this, we've done the same thing with models, right? They were basically saying, look, uh, before, if I wanted to, solve a problem with AI, I need to hire some AI specialist. They would custom design a model for me, right? And that's very complex. And that has changed, right? Now I can just grab an LLM and prompt it and will that solve my problem? But that's really just the first step, right? I mean, it's like we, we, we invented networking or we invented the database, but the real benefits came in through all the services at the internet that were created on top of networking, right? Or, you know, all the applications that were built on top of databases. I think it's the same thing with AI, right? We've, we've invented the primitives, Right, but now we're going to build the applications on top, and I think we have no oh. idea what these applications are. I think that's a great point. I mean, I certainly feel like I, I've told a lot of people. I feel like even if the technology we've got today roughly froze in time, there's like a decade's work worth of work and trillions of dollars of value that's to right. create with the tools, and they're not going to stay still. But nonetheless, like it tells you, this came. It's also weird, isn't it? Strange because it to me, I, I know that people are working on this forever, right? And I, I have a good friend actually who was doing, you know, some of the earliest like you know, chatbot stuff in like, oh eight, right, oh nine, 
um, you know, back when neural networks just barely became like feasible at a much less grand scale. And obviously, everybody got you know, blindsided by how incredibly powerful they got, you know, given the massive text data of the internet plus massive scale of these number of neurons, and it kind of blew everybody away. Well, maybe not everybody, right? Maybe Andre wasn't surprised at all, right? His paper was 2015. He was already kind of talking about how the uncanny abilities, I think it was called. But anyways, to pivot away from this, actually, let me ask you this, like, on a personal level, what was the, what was the moment for you? Were you, like, because obviously you've done so many things. Um, you were working for a while, you know, doing some networking things again at Intel. But what was the moment where AI kind of caught your, where we got the bug, I guess? I mean, one thing was definitely playing around with GPT, right? Uh, that was you know, GPT-3 back then. Right, that was a quantum leap where I was like, wow, I had no idea this was possible. <laughs> uh, you know, the same thing again with um, with Midjourney and Stable Diffusion, right? Uh, you know, and specifically Stable Diffusion training models, uh, fine tuning models, and then using them. That was like a, you know, really changed, changed my thinking. And, um, you know, and, and then really just starting to use that in day to day work, right? Where I'm, um, you know, started drafting emails with that and, you know, summarizing texts and so on, right? And, and there was like this, we've, we've, built a, we've built a new component that can do something which we previously couldn't do, right? And that, that sets the gear in motion. Yeah, you know, if this is what we can do today, you know, what are all the secondary effects of this? We have no idea, but it's probably going to change the world. Yeah, I, I mean, if it hasn't already. I think like, another yeah. big one was when, honestly, when, when um, the first time we used a multimodal model and pointed at our kids' homework, and was able to do probably, you know, half or maybe even uh, two thirds of the homework. You look at this and like, so that probably means that between half and two thirds of the things they teach at school are no longer relevant, right? Because if anything can be solved with your phone by taking a photo within a, at a second, right? Not really that important anymore that you still know how to do that, right? You probably want to manage this at a higher level now, right? Yeah. And that's such a profound change, right? If you're saying like, you know, we probably need to change half to two thirds of the curriculum and you know, realistically we'll have to cha change all of the curriculum. Uh, you know, that'll keep us busy for a decade, right? And how, how artists are using stable diffusion today, you know, before that has gone through, uh, you know, the training of, uh, in, in, like I say, in an arts class at a university, an arts major at university, that'll take us a decade to fully absorb that. There's so many things, I think, where we have a very long time to catch up. It's, it's pretty amazing, actually. I, it makes me wonder, too, do you feel like one of the things that somebody pointed out really early on is that Midjourney had this incredible edge because the the structure of interacting with it, right, and having to pick an image to upscale, gave you this like continuously evolving. And for them, because they were so big, so fast, so early, just this unbelievably massive like RLHF, you know, DPO style database for images, right? Which I think why they're just, I mean, the stuff in V6 is just mind blowing. It's so amazing. Um, do you think that there's an equivalent though for for text, because I wonder, you know, every once in a while, Chat GPT wants to have me pick column A or column B, things like that, and I wonder if uh, I wonder if if OpenAI will will benefit similarly from just having such a ridiculously large install base. Well, absolutely. I think you know any kind of human feedback helps, um, right? And I think we're getting very good in in leveraging that efficiently to to train models. Um, you know, there is. It, it narrows the model for a particular use case, but in many cases, that's exactly what you want, right? So it's, it's I, I think, you know, like, like, in, like in any industry, if you're the first one to do something, you get the most data of what people are using it for, and you can use that to refine your product, right? And I think in, for, for models, we're seeing that play out even a bit more strongly than in, uh, in many other areas. It makes me wonder, have you seen anybody who's done like an intentional interface where they do like a beam search type of thing and like, I want five different answers, but in a GUI level, you like, and it intentionally forces them to be reasonably diverse, basically, you know, maybe like forces token, you know, to select different tokens based on the probability at like key junctures, that kind of thing. I have not, but it would make a ton of sense. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like every once in a while I ask something of ChatGPT and it gives me an answer. I'm like, okay, this technically solves this problem, but it seems like a really ugly hack to do what I'm asking for. Like, what if you kind of did it this way and then it pops out something? I'm like, oh, that's much better. That's two lines of code and it looks nice as opposed to like Actually, 11 lines and it looks unreadable and horrible. So that's interesting. You know what? Uh, some, some coding assistants do that. You can, you can just have auto-completion in the, in the flow, like in, in your document. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, but you can also say, you know, 
write a function that does the following. Give me five different options, right? And you can then pick which one you like. Oh, which 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 code don't let you specify? Because obviously, Copilot, if you do like the completion thing, it spits out ten, and they just tend to not be good. You know, most of them can do that actually. A Copilot can do it, and there's a separate hot key for give me several options. Okay. I've been using a cursor a bunch myself, and obviously ChatGPT native and, and some other things. But yeah, the, none of us are making it super, none of the ones that I'm touching are, are doing it. I would love to see that too for certain particular use cases, which actually makes me think like you made that point earlier about the efficiency gain. And it, it does make me feel like if you have somebody you pay $100,000 or $200,000 a year and a subscription is 10 or 20 or 30, it's like there actually is room in the market for four different tools, not just to succeed. But literally succeed with the same user base if they do things slightly differently and the person yeah. knows how to pick well, tool A over tool B. I think, uh, you know, all these companies are, are understanding that if they can offer more value, there's probably a lot of price elasticity to go up, up market. Yeah. Honestly, I'm surprised some of the stuff is as cheap as it is. I mean, I guess it's also gives it a competition, but it's like it's shockingly good for everything that it does. It's, I think it makes some level of sense because in the early days you want to grab market share. Right. I guess especially if there's value in that human feedback data too, right? I mean, it's, and it's not exactly a network effect, but it's got it's got value also to just, make you sticky, I guess. Yeah. Being being the number number one and number two company in this space is still worth something, yeah. so I think it's uh, it's reflects to how. Uh, or or be the number one company in all the spaces if your model's that good, right? So it'll be interesting to see what keeps happening there. there we go. See. Um, yeah, what do you think about open source versus proprietary? Because that's a huge one. I mean. Should have mentioned that earlier. It's like such a big thing. It's always on my mind, especially with the Mistral leak that just happened. Yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of open source, right? I mean, the there's so much debate around alignment of models. You know, what exactly should a model do or what should it not do? And it, it seems very hard for me to imagine that we as mankind will have the United Nations uh, authority on model alignment. We all agree on what the standard is, right? So you probably don't want to have this power concentrated in a few large companies, right? But you want to have a, a good amount of diversity and, and flexibility. And for that, we need open source, right? You want to have models that you can take and fine tune and evolve in, in a way that you want. Um, you know, and also open source has this tendency to foster innovation, right? Because it doesn't give too much power to any any single players. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of open source. Uh, you know, the, I think the last 12 months have been incredibly encouraging how open source has caught up, right? When, when GPT-4 came out, well, actually, let's make it but January last year, right? There was basically the best open source model was, no. Guys, um, when I started looking, I was looking at like Bloom and it probably wasn't the best, but it was like, I just noticed it because it was so Yeah, big. but something like that. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe a Dolly or something was out, but, but you know, there wasn't wasn't much much there yet. That was really competitive, right? And then Llama and Llama 2 came out, very fantastic. And then Mistral, right? Uh, which is Apache 2. So it's a super, um, super broad license. And, uh, you know, a mixed trial, uh, A times 7B, yeah, that's a very competitive model, right? I mean, that shows up, um, you know, ranking, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, number two after the the top open AI models, right? So it's, yeah. it's a, uh, you know, that, that's really is very encouraging, right? It means, you know, have a model, you can use it, and uh, there's a lot of things you can do with it. Feels great for progress. Well, I know you got to go, and I appreciate you taking all the time. It's always a pleasure, um, whether it's virtual or, Thanks or for in having person. Me. Yeah, it's so, so great, and it's just a fun to see you. Having known you before AI, it's fun to see you in this space too. And you just bring like a ridiculous amount of energy, which I totally love. So it's always great to see you um, talking about stuff. So again, thank you very much for the time and um, I'll catch you later. Fantastic. Great to see you, Matt.